I don't know how many of you out there have had to take a final exam, but we know that if you've gone to college, that can be a really stressful time in your life as all of a sudden you come up to a point where they're going to test everything that you're supposed to have learned in that semester. I know of people that stay up all night using no dos and other things to stay awake and study and study and study and go forward to take the test so that they can achieve a high mark and look good to the professor. And then again, others really don't care much about it. They go along and do things, but they've showed their knowledge in other ways and may not achieve as high of a mark. But when they come out, other than just regurgitating what a professor had taught them, they actually learned how to function in society. Today we have a story which seems a really harsh story. There's these three guys and this master, this, sir, or this owner, who's going away and he entrusts them with money, each according to their ability, right? So he gives one five, another two, and another one one. Now a talent in those days was equivalent to 15 years of pay. So he was entrusting a lot of money to them. The one that got the five talents, it's 75 years worth of income. Kind of what we do when we retire, at least we hope we get back when we retire. And to the other one with just two was 30 years. And then the one that just got the one talent, he got 15 years worth of money. Now this whole talent thing comes in the Greek because the New Testament's written in Greek. And that word has come to be talent, like talent, the abilities that you have to do things. It used to be monetary, now not so monetary. Now it's a gift that you have. We always say that like a singer, he's got a gift of song or they've got a gift of being able to build things, a gift of being able to do things. That's what talent has come to. We're all given different talents that we have. And the only thing that we have is that we need to use them and we need to account for them. Unfortunately, we live in a capitalistic country where it's more to gather and gather and gather and continue gathering. The talent isn't much to be impressed about. Instead, it's how much we have, how big our car is, how big our house is, how big things are that we own. I know a lot of preachers preach this whole thing about stewardship, that this gospel reading is about stewardship. But we also preach it in a way of a punishing owner, a punishing master, someone who's harsh. And yet God, or the owner in this book that we relate to being God, had been pretty generous. He gave one guy 75 years worth of wages. The other 30 and the other 15, he gave a huge amount to them. He was generous, he wasn't harsh. When he comes back, he continued to be generous to the two that reaped in for him, he gave it back to them. Now the third servant was a little bit different. He lived his life a little bit different than the other two. Maybe he wasn't as outgoing, maybe he didn't have as much trust in his ability to do things, but he kind of lived his life in fear. Not kind of, he lived his life in fear. He was fearful that he was gonna lose this. He was fearful that if he lost it, the owner would be upset. A lot of us live our life in fear but we see this whole harshness of the master in a different way of his generosity and inviting the other two back into what they have. And we see the third slave as being driven by fear. And this kind of turns the whole gist of this story. You see, we have to have a willingness to reduce our fear. We have to have a willingness to live with some risk trusting the ways that are put in front of us. We have to have joy as we await for the master's return, not fear. 
See, we can't be ruled by fear. We can't let our lives be directed by fear. We have to be willing to make an investment, a willingness to make a risk. See, Jesus was on a high-risk venture, wasn't he? See, he could have stayed in Galilee, where it was safe and nobody was going to come out to get him. But instead, he decided, I'm going to Jerusalem, where the authorities were, where the Romans were, where he was going to get in trouble, and he knew it. Throughout his ministry, he's telling his disciples, I'm going someplace where they're going to hurt me. The disciples said, no, 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 you're not. You're not going to do that. They didn't believe him until it happened. And then they lived their life in fear, at least for a little while. You see, the third slave or the third servant was not a bad person. He just was a cautious investor. I don't know how many of you have retirement accounts where they're telling you you can go the risky rate or the, the which has more rewards or the safe way which has less rewards. This third person was willing to live in the safe way. See, he wanted it all to be safe and sound. It wasn't about what he was going to get back. And neither is this parochopy from the, the gospel. It's not about doubling your money, which the other two people did. It's about being able to accept the greater risk and not living your life and not risking anything. See, taking risks is what Jesus has taught his followers. And it's what it means to be faithful for Jesus we have to give our hearts away, and we know that when you give your heart away, you're taking a great risk. That that heart can be broken, that that heart can be hurt, that you can be hurt. But think about it, maybe the greater risk is playing it safe. We know that in the seven deadly sins, there was this sin called sloth, right? Where you're going to go out and you're going to consume and gather things. But sloth isn't about gathering things. See, sloth is about not loving. Sloth is about not rejoicing, not having joy waiting for the return. Sloth is about not living your life to the full potential you have it. You're going to play it safe. Sloth is about investing nothing. And sloth is about burying your money. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, I don't know if you know him, he was in Germany. He gave his life in following during World War II. He said that this story, this by Jesus, was about running away from your responsibilities, which we in the United States do really well. You see, Jesus was here for us. He wasn't here playing it safe. He wasn't here not risking it. I watched this show on network. I know my wife is probably like, why does he watch this? It's called Lucifer and it's about the devil. And it's about the devil being a fallen angel. It's about the devil continuing to do the work of God. I'm not so sure if the theology is in place or even the theology about a devil but the one thing that has hit me is that the people who are in hell aren't in hell because God created it, aren't in hell because the fallen angel Lucifer created it. They're in a hell that they created themselves. You see, faith isn't about personal comfort and faith isn't about personal security. And faith isn't about getting one's personal theology correct. And faith isn't about going somewhere like going to heaven. I know that the faithful, or at least the ones that propose to be faithful, the ones who have all the answers, tell you to live a good life, avoid the bad, religion's not risky. I think Pope Francis put it well when he first took power over the Roman Catholic Church, he told his priests to get off their butts, get out of their office, get on the streets where they can do something. Being a minister or a priest is more than getting up here and preaching. It's more than putting on the robes. You see, Jesus has invited us into a risky discipleship. See, it's not about believing in Jesus 
It's about following Jesus. It's easy to say I'm a disciple of Jesus. Jesus, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But it's a lot harder to accept the responsibilities of the lessons that Jesus has tried to teach us. It's a lot harder to accept the responsibility for the precious lives that God has given us. And churches do the same thing. We bury our money, we keep it in the bank, we take the interest and reinvest it, not in the community, but in the bank. So that when a rainy day comes, we have enough money. Well, I'm here to tell you that that rainy day has come. It's time for us to go out and be loving. It's time for us to go out and face those things that are affecting our society, like joblessness, like COVID, like homelessness. It's risky, but it's what Jesus has asked us to do. See, Jesus asked us to be bold, to reach high, and to care deeply. Jesus has invited us into an adventure to become a high-risk disciple of Christ. Jesus has not invited us to take a final exam, to pass that exam and enter heaven. Jesus has invited us to be risky disciples, to bring the kingdom of heaven down here to earth. Amen.